Good morning. Good morning. Great to be with you this morning. Take a little bit to make sure you have a chance to greet everybody around you today. Good morning. Let's begin with our opening hymn, the first three verses of hymn 143 in the red hymn. Lord, have mercy. 
for the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Amen. Amen. Come to us also by word and sacrament and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I can do Open your pew Bible to page 1106. For the Easter season, often the first lesson comes from the book of Acts. And so it is this morning. We get to see the courage that the disciples had because they knew Jesus was real. Jesus is alive. From Acts chapter 5, verse 12, and then verse 17 and following. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. Verse 17, then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, he found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles 
They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. He says... God's Word. Amen. Amen. Turn to page 4 of the bulletin and read responsibly our psalm this morning, Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Second lesson. Also, our sermon text, you can find it, page 1168 in your pew Bible, 1168. These first three Sundays of Easter, we're working our way through, with God's help, through the resurrection chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This morning, we'll tackle the, the middle part of that chapter, verses 12 through 34. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ. We are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself. 
who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Now if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. This is God's word. Amen. Amen. We stand. The Holy Gospel, page 1096 in your Pew Bible. Really start with the very bottom of 1095, just two lines there at the bottom. The Gospel according to John, chapter 20. Glory be to you, O Lord. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then, he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See, my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated for the sermon hymn. It's in the red hymnal, number, hymn number 160. As we're getting ready to sing that, let me just draw your attention in, in your bulletin. You should have received a a sermon note sheet. We've got a lot of ground to cover in the sermon today, so this might help you follow along. There's also a connection card if you could all use the 
pen that you were given to fill that out. Look at the back side. There's some great things to sign up for or you put your prayer request there in the back. We'll turn those in after the sermon with the offering. Again, our, our sermon hymn is number 160 in the Red Hymnal, this joyful Easter time. Everything. And I don't mean to put 
Jesus' resurrection on the same level as a pizza recipe or a cup of burnt water or a toothpick. But Easter. Easter is what really should go in the blank. Easter really does change everything. It has that kind of power right now in your life every hour, every day. Because Easter says our religion is a lot more than, than a philosophy that lives on. You know, like, like some kind of philosophy that says love people no matter what. Or, or shine a light wherever you are. Our, our religion, Easter says, is a lot more than a spirit that lives on. Oh, you know, as long as we can treat other people the way Jesus treated them, then, then the spirit of Jesus lives on. No, our religion is, is a lot more than wishful thinking. Oh, that Jesus, he was so wonderful that the disciples, they couldn't bear the thought that he could still be dead. Easter says, our religion is it, about a uh, a living one who is dead and now he's alive forever and ever who holds in his living mighty hand the very keys of death and the grave and who holds you in his living and mighty hand. If you were driving or walking down the road and you came to a fork in the road, a place where you had to decide to go to the left or the right and you didn't have your phone and you didn't have your map or your AAA trip tip, remember those? <laughs> You didn't know which way to go. You might be glad that there were two men to ask directions of. Two men who, who, who looked like they were from around there. You could ask directions of them. But here is the difference between the two men. One of the men is a dead man. And the other man is an alive person. Which one are you going to ask for direction? Nothing against the dead guy. I mean, he probably was a really nice person. But what sense would it make to ask him for direction. Our Savior Jesus is who we get direction from. And he's no dead man. He's alive. Has all the wisdom of heaven in his mind. And he's going to guide you, not just for one turn in the road here and there. He will be our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to the end. And to have a Savior like that, a living Lord and Savior, a guide, a protector like that, with an unfathomable kind of love in his heart for you to have that, knowing you will never leave your side. That's something that it's supposed to change everything. That's what our verses talk about in the most emphatic way from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul wants to paint for you the bleak picture of what it would be like if nothing had changed. If Easter hadn't risen from the dead and so nothing had changed. And so he says it again and again. If Christ had not then, maybe, then what? Because that changes everything. Now, now there, there are a lot of people who, who would say they believe Jesus is risen from the dead. They would say they believe Christ has been raised and yet look at their life and it's hard to see anything has changed. How honest are those people being on the other hand, you got plenty of people say, yeah, that Easter thing, I can't really believe that. I mean, it sounds nice and all, but somebody rising from the dead, things like that just don't happen. That's, that's too much for me to believe. A person like that is wrong. But at least, at least they're on. Which one is, is being more honest, huh? The person who says, oh, I just can't really believe that Easter stuff. Or the person who says, oh yeah, I believe it. But there's no power of Easter anywhere in that person's daily life. This person's name might seem weird to you. A pastor from Greece 
wrote a whole book about First Corinthians 15. This is what he says. People may honestly reject the resurrection because why? Because they're not satisfied with the evidence. Or, or they're staggered by the vastness of its significance and splendor. Or they are hesitant in giving credence to an unparalleled event that has happened once and only once in the history of the world. You may honestly say that. Easter is hard to believe. But no one can honestly accept the resurrection who does not show forth in daily life the proof of its deep and perpetual power. And the same author, he gives you a bunch of questions you might want to ask yourself to see. Is any of the power of Easter making it into your life? You know, what does the resurrection of Christ mean to me? How much does it influence my life, my thoughts? How much courage or resolve does it fill me with? If Christ had not risen, what would I lose? If Christ had not risen, what difference would that make in how I think, how I act? If God took Easter right out of the Bible, took it out of the creed and everything, would I still believe the rest? Or would that change the way I look at the future, or the unseen world, or death, or what comes after death? If God took Easter right out of the Bible, what, what would that take out of my heart? Day to day. What feelings would that take out of my heart day to day? If Jesus had never left that tomb, what would I have less of? Less courage, less enthusiasm, less life. We've got a lot of ground to cover today. I'm going to have a different list up there. Maybe you can just grab one thing from each list and take home with you. But these are some serious questions to ask yourselves. Has Easter changed anything for me? The thing is, you can deny Christ's resurrection with your mouth, and you can also deny it with your unchanged life. Either way, you're not sending a very good message to the world. Paul talks about that. What, what are you saying? Whether you deny that Jesus rose from the dead, whether you deny that with your mouth and say it didn't happen, or, or you deny it with your unchanged life, what are you saying to the world uh, about all preachers? Well, you are saying that they are useless. <laughs> that they lie about God. Paul says that Christ has not been raised. Our preaching is useless and we are false witnesses about God. All the preachers might as well shut up. And what else are you saying about your faith? You're saying your faith is useless too. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile. It's pointless. And whatever you hear in your pretty little church isn't worth believing whether you deny that Christ has risen from the dead with your mouth or with your unchanged life, what is that saying to the world about, about the dead? Let's say they're lost and you are never going to see them again. And all of a sudden, all the secretaries of the world just got a whole lot sad. And what are you saying about your sin? That you are still in them. So all the shameful things you've done, all the stink that you have brought into your soul with sin, it's all still there and you still reek with it. Because the East Church is our only proof that Christ's death on the cross was enough. Whether you deny it with your mouth or with your unchanged life that Jesus has risen from the dead, what are you saying to the world about, about your hopes? The hopes you claim to have as a Christian, that they are pitiful. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied. To be pitied! And what are you saying about the end? You're saying God doesn't win. Because that's what the end is supposed to be. That's how the end of the world, the end of the story is supposed to be. That death gets defeated. That the God of life the God of life and healing and beauty and wholeness, that, that he wins out in the end. Because so long as there's all kinds of pain and death and suffering in this world, then God isn't all in all. But Easter was the proof that that victory was coming, that triumph was coming. Without Easter, it isn't ever going to come. You can, you can deny that Jesus rose from the dead with your mouth, 
or, or with your unchanged life, either way, you're sending an awful message to the world, to your family. It's not just about the message that you're sending, the life itself is awful. Paul talks about that too. What kind of life is that? He says it is a life that corrupts. Bad company corrupts good character. And he's saying, if, if you say all kinds of great things about Jesus, but, but nothing changes in your life, you are the bad company. You are a danger and a poison in your church. And other people should stay away from you, like, like 2 Timothy 3, verse 5 says about people who, who have a form of godliness, but deny its power. They have a form of, of believing in Easter. They can sing the hallelujahs and the glory glories can spill out of their mouths and they can say all kinds of fine things about that empty food, but they don't deny its power. What, what are you supposed to do with people like that? Paul says, have nothing to do with them. Because that kind of company will corrupt you. A life like that. A life like that is a senseless life. It has no sense. Come back to your senses, Paul says, as you are, and stop sinning. The, the word Paul uses there is talking about drunkenness. This is a spiritual drunkenness. Your soul is hung over and passed out for snookered on the ground. You are in a drunken stupor in your faith when you live like that. This kind of life is an ignorance of God. Whatever else you say, you know about God. You show with your life that you still have a grasp that his son is alive and dead. You don't know God. And there is a day coming when he will have to say, he doesn't know you yet. And this kind of life, Paul says, is a shame. I say this to your shame. That's how our verses end today. To your shame. But this isn't something, you know, a little kind of oops. Or, oh, I guess we, we should work on this as a church. No, this is a shame. To have a group that calls itself a Christian church and people in that group live like Easter hasn't changed them. This is reprehensible. This is inexcusable. This is it's a shame. About five years ago, uh, this movie came out. The Greatest Showman, uh, Hugh Jackman portraying a very fictionalized version of the circus master, P.T. Barnum. And then one of the songs in the movie is called Come Alive. And in the song, they talk like, what is going to make dead people finally come to life? Oh, come in to see the circus. Listen, listen to the word. <laughs> Through the days, got your head on low, your skies are shaded gray. Zombie enemies, two please. You're asleep inside, but you can shake away. Cause you're just a dead man walking. Think about your only option, but you can flick the switch. You got one of your darkest days. Sun's up and the colors blind. Put the world in redefine it. Leave the house and now I'm mine. You'll never be the same. Come alive. Come alive. What is this song saying? You are just a dead man walking until what? Until you see a little Tom Thumb and a bearded lady and an acrobat and lion tamers. Oh man, life will never be the same. And the, 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 the switch will be flipped on. It's been a long time since I've been to the circus. So maybe I just don't remember how spondiferous it really is. But when you're talking like that, you should talk about Jesus coming out of that tomb. That's what this song should be about. <gasps> but, but so many, they walk through life like that. That man walking. The sky's a shame of me. Like a zombie through a man. How can you say your Savior lives and reigns over your life and, and, and walk through life like the, the switch still hasn't been flipped on? St. Paul today, he says, come alive. 
Stop stumbling through your life like that. Like some pitch black maze. Look at the bright light of Easter morning. Let it blind you once again with this color and come alive. Okay, so we've worked through the, the, the scary parts of our verses, huh? The warning parts of our verses, the beginning and the end of our section here in the middle of 1 Corinthians 15. Now let's take a little time in the middle of those verses, the glorious part. That talks about how the glorious day of Easter guarantees an even more glorious day. Guarantees two irreversible realities. When that angel came and rolled the stone away to show that Jesus wasn't in that tomb anymore, that set in motion a whole lot more than those terrified soldiers' knees, huh? That set in motion two irreversible events. They are coming. They have been catalyzed. The fuse has been lit. Nothing can hold them back. What are those two irreversible realities set in motion by Jesus' resurrection? Paul says they are the great big wake up. And the day when God again becomes all in all. The great big wake up. Easter morning, Jesus' resurrection has set in motion the irreversible reality of the great big wake up. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, but he was only the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He was only the start of that, of that harvest. Well, Pastor, we don't get fruits out of the ground. Okay, then think about him as the first potato. I don't know. What farmer, when they're digging one potato on the ground, stops there? Oh, I can make like 12 french fries out of this. Yes. No. My, my backdoor neighbor, when I lived up in Wapan, Mr. Anderson, he would grow potatoes in, in his bar in the backyard. He never stopped with one. No, you get that first one out of there. And I'm like, okay, my potatoes didn't rot. Let's go. And you dig up the rest and you're ready to eat your taters all winter long. And so when, when Pug raised his son Jesus out of the dead, that was just the first potato. That was just the first. And there was a guarantee that there were going to be some more. God was excited to think about the rest of the harvest that was coming. And that's you. We are the rest of God's potatoes. Oh, it isn't just the, the dig up. It's the wake up. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. When Jesus came out of that tomb alive, he showed that now in him, oh, there's the potatoes, eh? Now in him, Death is just asleep. And he showed in his glorious resurrection how glorious it is going to be to wake up from that sleep. And the second tremendous, irreversible reality set in motion by Christ rising from the dead is that day when God gets to be all in all again. When the harm that Adam brought into the world finally gets undone. A couple Novembers ago, maybe you remember, we were trucking right along, coming out of COVID, and then Pastor got COVID, and we shut down the church for a month, and I got to preach on these verses from my living room through the computer. This is what I said about this. Then, that day when God is all in all, God will be the only song we're singing, the only story we're telling, the only lesson we're learning. God will be the answer to every question, the most satisfying answer you have ever heard. Everywhere you go, everywhere you look, His love, His presence, filling all your senses, all in all. And so infinitely good, you're never going to come close to getting tired out of Him. No more searching for Him or waiting for His prayer answers or wondering for His reasons why, but always His time, His way, His will, and His same. No shadows infringing on His light, no sins against His law, no knows to His yes, no troubles for His children ever again. When Christ goes Easter morning, this reality was set in motion, set on its way, on a collision course for your soul, for your body, for your future, the day when God gets to be all in all again. Realities like that, joyful hopes like that, change every, every hour, every day. That's how Paul taught. 
in our verses this morning. Every hour, every day, he says, Easter's changing my life, changes everything. Because you think about what Easter has set in motion, we didn't even hardly talk about forgiveness and, and, and the peace that Easter brings, and just knowing that Jesus is with you all the time, all these different things that Easter has set in motion. What, what kind of life does that prepare you for? How, how daringly can you live knowing that you have a living Savior like that in your corner? Oh, you are ready for a whole lot more than you drink to be merry. That's what Paul says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Oh, but because, because Jesus has risen, life is a whole lot more than a full belly or a full beer cooler or whatever kind of high quality fun 5G internet and a real good phone can bring you. Oh, there's a whole lot more than that for life. But Jesus rises from the dead. Paul says you can be ready to endanger yourself every day. Oh, that's how Paul lived for Jesus. He says, if there's no resurrection, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? But there, in fact, is a resurrection, and Jesus, in fact, does live. And so following him is so wonderful. Even if he leads me into new dangers every hour, I'm staying on his table. I'm staying with him, Paul says. Yes, ready even to die every day. Paul talks that way, too. He says, I face death every day. To know that Jesus lives and is real and he loves you. Doesn't matter what cost you. To stay with him. Every day, be ready to face death itself. To stay with him. Oh yes. Yes, it's worth it. Because, because he lives. Every hour, every day, Paul says. This means everything to me. Think about we energies. You know they're the, the fourth largest Wisconsin-based publicly held company. Fourth largest. Seven billion dollars in revenue every year. How did they get so profitable, so successful? Because, well, you know, that's how big your gas bill is. But, but besides that, how did they get so, so profitable? It wasn't from being dumb or unreliable. Like the guy who planted nine volt batteries in his backyard hoping to grow a power plant. <laughs> no, not like that. How did, how did we energies keep getting money from their 4.6 million customers? Because. Almost every time you go to the light switch, you're trying to charge up your phone. Or electricity every hour. Every day. Easter power is like that. Except better. There's like 22 countries in the world that have more reliable electricity than the United States. Well, Easter power is reliable at all. Every hour. Every day. That's how it was for Paul. That's how it was for all the apostles. Remember how terrified they were after they saw their Savior killed on the cross? You'd be terrified too. They were hiding. They locked themselves behind the door. They, they thought they were going to be next. They weren't talking to anybody about Jesus. Except maybe. And then when they saw Jesus was alive again, boom, nobody could hold them back. We heard that in our first lesson today. We're going to obey God rather than men. We can't help but speak about what we have seen and heard. How it began is to change them from then on. A little video you can watch uh, where they ask men, and not like for women, but this one's for men, uh, of every age from 5 to 75, they ask each one, what's the greatest thing you've ever done? Let's just watch the first couple minutes of this. Okay? What's the bravest thing you've ever done? I don't want to talk about that. Swam. I jumped into the five feet zone at the pool and I landed right in front of the instructor. Saving my mom from a bug that was about to bite her. Told somebody not to do something that was dangerous. I went into a haunted house. Stood up for my friend. I stood up to a teacher. Climbing a steep mountain. 
me and my friends went to a very scary haunted house. It goes on all the way up to age 75. Ask somebody of every age. What's the bravest thing you've ever done? And a lot of them say, oh, I saved a life. Or I stood up to this person or for that person. I spoke up. Or, or a lot of them, I moved. I moved to America. Or I moved to New York. I moved out of my parents' house. Some of the answers are funny. Some of them are serious. The guy at uh, age 55, he says, the bravest thing he ever did was standing next to his daughter's cast at the funeral. At age 56, the guy says, getting married. And then he laughs. There's a couple guys. There's a guy at age 41. And then the guy again at age 65, these two guys, they say they don't think they had ever done anything great in their whole life. Don't be those guys. Don't be those guys. How can you be those guys when you know Easter? When your Savior is risen from the dead and said, let's go. Here's some, here's some ideas. Great things you can do because your Savior is alive. Again, it's a big list. Pick one or two. Take them home with you. Get after it, huh? Don't be those guys that never done anything great in my whole life. Maybe tell somebody about one of your sins. You should have done you. Get some help. Or how about asking a stranger or your neighbor or your next waitress or your next cashier? Anything I can pray about for you? Next time you're with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, say no to that stuff you usually do that you really should be married and should be doing. Somebody needs a lot of help, they'll go ahead and be the one help. It takes a lot of bravery for that. Give up control in some area of your life. Be a friend to a stranger. Be crazy generous to somebody. Just crazy generous. What's the bravest thing you've ever done? Well, maybe it's actually putting down your phone or that book you've got your nose in or that remote for the TV. Putting it down to pay attention to the people that have been around you your life for an hour. Or asking your spouse or your parent or somebody close to you in your life, how could I make your life easier? And then do it. Or that stuff you've been angry about for so long, how about finally facing up to that? Deal with it. Change. That thing you knew when you know you need to change. What about being ready to change it? Or, or the person who is having a hard time, be ready enough to go and follow up and say, hey, how are you? How's that turn out for you? Or somebody needs to talk. Really listening to them. Somebody you've been lying to. Tell them. And change whatever you have to change in your life so that you never do it again. Or maybe giving somebody else a chance to change your mind. Somebody you know disagrees with you. Actually listening to them and seeing why they think the way they do. Or talking to somebody powerful, telling them, you aren't really doing your job, and you need to do it now. Or maybe this would be the greatest thing of all. What Jesus says, in everything, in everything, he says, how are you supposed to treat others? Exactly the way you want people to treat you. Start doing that. See how much bravery you need. I don't want to get the impression that the Christian life is just unending stress and danger and dying every day. And certainly some people are called to, to callings like that. St. Paul was called to calling like that. But even he would say, that isn't my life. My life in Jesus is filled with delight because every time I turn a corner in my life, I find my living Savior waiting for me. What corner are you afraid to go in? What fears are holding you back? What brave things has Jesus been asking you to do? 
And you have been anointed. Come to your senses. St. Paul said. Come to your senses. Your Savior is alive. There's no reason for you to live like that. How dare you? How dare you? We can be. With Jesus on our side, this changes everything. Come alive. Come alive. Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond understanding of our own mind. In Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and practice talking about it. God used the words of the nice new three pages, five and six of the book. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light. True God and true God, begotten and not made, of one being in the Father, who can make all things away for us and for our salvation, who came down from heaven, was the fire of the Holy Spirit and the birth of Mary and the beginning of Holy Union. For our sake, he was crucified and not not inspired. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again and according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in union with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken from the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Yeah, I'm just going to please finish showing out that connection fire. Hold it up and put that in the pot for today. <laughs> Besides bringing an offering to church, I hope all of you know that you can sign up for more of this thing called push take to take your offering on your credit card for your faith. Just do that for you automatically every week. Uh, if you could have prayed about maybe signing up for something like that too, or increasing your gift, it will be a blessing to others who are going to.
Please stand and join me in prayer before the throne of God. Lord Jesus, here we are a week after Easter, right where Thomas was, when he, uh, he still wasn't believing in you, when he doubted, when he said he, w- he wasn't going to believe till he, he touched the hole in your hand and, and stuck his hand in the spear wound in your side. And you came. You took care of all of Thomas's doubts. He, he fell at your feet. He proclaimed you his Lord and his God. And you promise that we will be blessed. If we believe to, Lord Jesus, come and, and take away our doubts, take away all hesitation from our hearts like you did for Thomas. Come in your body and your blood here in the supper. Come through your word. Pour out the Holy Spirit. And give us a powerful and a constant faith that you are our living Lord and God. This very day, you came among your own and you said, peace be with you. You gave your fearful disciples with with their locked doors, you gave them a peace and a courage that is beyond understanding. Come here, come here to Garden Homes. Come to all your people and give the same. We pray this for the sake of your empty tomb. And hear us as we bring you our private petition. Precious living Savior Jesus Christ, cause the peace of your empty tomb to rule our hearts and fill us with a daring that we will dare to serve you in all that we do, to live in peace and love with fellow man, to be a light and a salt and to broadcast throughout the world the blessed message that has cheered our souls. Wake us up to live like this in your blessed resurrected name. We pray in that name and we pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. And God placed under his feet all things and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever.
Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. <laughs> package, bread and wine sets there if you prefer, grab them on your way up. We will also have the individual cups and then the common cup. So if you are taking either the prepackaged or the individual, just hold that out so when I come by with the common cup, I'll see that and we'll try to, to give you even more. Thank you.
Stand, sing the hymn verse at the bottom of page eight. have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, do good to all people, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll stay standing for the last hymn. Please join in as you can.
seated. Great to be with you today. We got a brief Bible class, getting back into the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 13. That'll be in the cafeteria this morning. We're looking for help uh, on Friday at 8 in the morning. The school's going to have a big dumpster here, and our downstairs church storage room is pretty well packed to the gills. So uh, if you are available Friday morning, we'll come to help us carry stuff out to the dumpster, clean out that store room. That'd be great. There's a neighborhood cleanup next Saturday. That no one about that is in, in the bulletin. And then I got a couple letters to read to you. Let me grab those quick. Thank you to all who reached out to Mr. Gregovich and Mrs. Bitter, telling them how wonderful our garden homes is. Uh, I believe that message got through to them. Here is their responses to the calls we extended to them to teach here. Well, Mrs. Bitter says, Dear members of Garden Homes Lutheran Church, on Monday, April 11th, I received a divine call to serve as first grade teacher at your school. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to evaluate how my gifts could be used to support your ministry. I greatly appreciate the encouragement and prayers of your staff and members during this time. Their love for the ministry at Garden Homes was evident. After prayerful consideration, the Lord has led me to return the call to teach at Garden Homes. I pray that God continues to bless your ministry, and I trust that the Lord will provide the right person to serve your families at Garden Homes in Christ. This is Stacy Bitter. And I don't, I don't think I got a letter actually yet from Mr. Gregovich, but he did call me personally uh, Friday morning and said it was a lot harder decision than he thought it was going to be, that uh, we did an incomparable job of reaching out to him and all the calls he has ever had. No church has ever reached out to him like we did. Uh, there was nothing possible we could have done to give him a better impression of our ministry. We really impressed him. And still he turned us down. He's staying, <laughs> staying in Minnesota. So uh, this means that uh, we do not give up. We, we have already sent in our request for graduates from Martin Luther College in New Orleans. And, uh, and we've been putting the full court press on the district president to let him know we need some teachers. So that's, uh, that's what we wait for next. Second weekend of uh, May or so, or third weekend. Um, find out if God gives us some graduates to teach. Well, I'm running out of things to say, but maybe I forgot something. Anything else? Yes, Mr. Cole. Uh, the first quarter of your statements are in the mailboxes. You can get them at your conveyance. Yeah, if you haven't noticed, it's about the middle of December. We've been a lot more active putting stuff in those mailboxes. Um, so if you haven't grabbed stuff on your mailbox recently, please do that. Anything else? Uh, it's such a treat to, to be your pastor. Last Sunday was just incredible. It was so wonderful. And uh, glad you came back for more. we got a whole other Sunday to wrap up 1 Corinthians 15 next week, right? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, O oh grave, is your victory? Because of Jesus, our labor in the Lord is not in vain. So we got to stand firm. That's what we get to hear about next week. It's going to be really energizing. So I hope you're here with me. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Mm -hmm.